special area of interest is in social inclusion and how to get people who have been marginalized to participate. So she's, she's really looked at how technologies can help in doing this. Um, we are, um, so we're delighted to have you here again. For those of you who don't know, Denise will also be running a three-day workshop from Wednesday to Friday this week in this <coughs> venue on 3D virtual learning environments. So the, it is nearly full because she can only um, take about 20 people at a time and I think we can only accommodate that in this venue. So those of you who still wish to come could uh, um, write to Michelle Grosh about that. So welcome, Denise, and um, thank you. We're really looking forward to what you have to say about flexible learning. Thanks very much, Bill. Okay, well, it's very good to be back with you all again. Some very familiar faces. Uh, this time, sort of talking more specifically about uh, flexible learning and those that can make it along, will be uh, engaging in a workshop focusing. Uh, more directly on one aspect or one particular medium that we do use for flexible learning. I want to begin... Um, oh, sorry, we've just got a window popped up there. There we go. I want to begin by um, looking at some different definitions around uh, flexible learning. I'm going to draw heavily in this presentation on the work of Collis and Moonen, uh, who've been writing on this, uh, in this field since 1997. So, you know, this isn't a, a new phenomenon, obviously. And they describe flexible learning as an approach which facilitates learner choice in different aspects of the learning experience. So it's very much a learner-centered approach. And in a similar vein, Hill in 2006 spoke of flexible learning as an approach which focuses on the provision of quality learning, and I think that's a really important aspect. It's not about the teaching uh, alone and the technology alone, it's about the quality of the learning experience. So the focus is much more on this learner-centred approach. But note the point about taking into account the learner's personal characteristics, learning styles, work responsibilities, which is a point I'll come back to later on because we do have a changing student demographic. I'm sure many of you have seen that. Um, certainly it's a, a, a phenomenon that we've noticed very much in Australia where students are spending much less time on campus, much more time working either part-time or even full-time. And we've got a surprising number of our full-time students who are actually working full-time, you know. So, therefore, the, the community life tends to suffer quite considerably. So, flexible learning is an approach that takes into account the individual learning styles and preferences of individual students, but also that wider kind of holistic notion that there are other factors that are impacting on an individual learner's experiences. So that will, of course, relate to their learning needs, desires, and those personal circumstances. So perhaps a, a more technically oriented um, definition by Sadler, Smith and Smith define flexible learning as a means of delivering learning for the acquisition of work-related knowledge and skills, which include the use of instructional technologies. That's a kind of more technology-focused, um, teacher-focused approach than the previous one. The previous one's the one I sort of tend to favour because it very much is about the learning experience, not just about the teaching or about the technology, but a combination of all those things. Um, and here we get the, the idea that, you know, we, we talked about distance education and in an earlier meeting I was talking about my own experiences at the University of South Australia where we began, when I first began at the university we had a distance education centre and then that became the flexible delivery centre and now it's called the flexible learning centre and that really does capture the way in which our university has moved from the notion of it being a separate unit developing packages to deliver to students to one that's much more focused on engaging academics to facilitate 
learner engagement, um, learner-centred focus again, rather than on teaching or technology alone. Um, so we've moved much more to the, a more holistic notion of flexible learning. Um, one of the things that they, uh, Sadler, Smith and Smith talk about is the separation of temporarily and spatially. By that means, you know, we've, we've heard the, the concept of learning anytime, anywhere at, um, and using any technology. So that's that notion of both the temporary, the temporal and the spatial uh, flexibility that's provided. Notice they're also talking about technology in the broadest context. It's not just about digital technology, but recognising there's still a place for print-based packages. Uh, if we um, talk about inclusive learning, we have to be cognizant that there are learners that don't have access to broadband technologies, that don't necessarily have laptops or access to computers that are able to run some of the software, students with disabilities who may need alternative formats. All of those are about flexible learning taking into account the diversity of students that we may have. And because of the diversity of students, of course we have to have a combination of technologies, not just digital and relying on electronic devices. So uh, I guess that sort of screen is just <coughs> capturing the, the idea that it's a combination. So when I talk about multimodal, I mean many kinds of media, uh, both traditional media as well as the digital enhanced technologies. Of course, we know that the origins of distance education go back to well over a century. What's interesting, of course, is while we've grown in our understanding about and technology has developed in that time, the basic fundamentals of focus on quality teaching and learning, pedagogy, still remain constant. So even if we look at some of the earlier writings in this field, you'll see there's still very much a focus on pedagogy. It's not just about the technology. One of the things was um, there have been sort of differences um, globally about the ways in which uh, uh, the notion of flexible learning, distance education initially and flexible learning has evolved. Um, Moore and Anderson cited in Hill talk about the US as kind of taking an approach where distance education was sort of a, a, the least of the best of the alternatives, you know, that if students couldn't come onto campus then it was a reasonable alternative. Of course we've really moved a long way from that now and recognising that through technologies in fact it is a more enriching experience. I think one of the most groundbreaking developments in the last decade really has been the emergence of Web 2.0 technologies. By that I mean the two-way web. Um, and O'Reilly in 2005 really coined the term Web 2.0 and it is about harnessing collective intelligence. It is about collaboration. And really when we think about it, that's what we talk about when we're talking about flexible learning as well. It's a, the quality of the interaction between the academic and between the students, between the students and the students. So the two-way web has enabled us to capture that much more effectively and to engage with learners who may not be on campus because we now are moving technologically to an environment that supports the sort of two-way interaction that we've always embraced in the face-to-face -face learning situation. Of course, it is still mediated in some way, but it's a much more enriching experience than Web 1.0, as we used to talk about it as being just delivering content. It's now much more about the quality of the <coughs> interaction. And you know, a lot of universities have been a little loath to um, get on the open education resources bandwagon because they feel that the quality of their material, all of the IP that's locked up in that content is precious to the university. But then why is it that universities like MIT have been able to not only introduce open educational resources and make their material available to the open community, but they're now even providing accredited um, courses 
available through OER. And why is that? Well, because they've recognised that the richness of the content is not the content alone. It's not about delivering the content. The richness of the experience is in the interaction with the academic. Again, something that Web 2.0 technologies do support very well. And of course, one of the other things that we've seen in the evolution of Web 2.0 um, with the, you know, the use of social media by our young people and so forth has been that it's also been embraced in the development of learning management systems. So of course, we've got Moodle, we've got Sakai, um, and uh, Mahara, and a number of other open source learning management systems that integrally incorporate these Web 2.0 technologies, wikis, podcasts, RSS feeds, really simple syndication, Twitter feeds and so forth, they are integrated into our learning management systems. So that enables our students to use a range of social media but also within their structured learning environment. Um, so again, drawing on Sattler Smith and Smith's work, they, the growth in flexible delivery has accompanied and been facilitated by these technological developments. And e-learning, as we know, is now widely accepted as an effective delivery medium for flexible learning. And so it really has shifted that notion of thinking about, you know, not being able to be on campus as a, as a, um, a second best alternative to really realising that you can learn in any time, any place, and any space. Um, and of course now we're moving much more to cloud-based technology where we store so much and even software such as Microsoft is now stored in the cloud. Now that has interesting implications when we talk about inclusive learning pedagogies because if students do have at least access to the internet, they don't need necessarily to have access to the software. They can, in fact, use a lot of the either the open source software or software that is now available through the cloud or through web-based um, databases. Some of the strategies, again, um, Interestingly, you know, if we look at Collison Moonen's work right back to 1997, the same principles still apply. Flexible learning is not just about technology, it's about the combination of technology, pedagogy, strategies for implementing teaching and learning, but also institutional factors which we can't overlook either. In an earlier meeting, I was talking about our universities taken a top-down, bottom-up approach to introducing um, our holistic approach to teaching and learning. And the reason that they've done that is that they realise that there need to be policies in place at the university level to support the pedagogy that we deliver with our students. Um, so this particular model that was developed um, by Collis and Moonan and sometimes referred to as the onion skin model. But it, it really just encapsulates the fact that all of these aspects are essential for an effective, flexible learning approach within an institution. <coughs> okay, um, so we talk about needing to improve flexibility in the location where the learner can carry out the different learning activities. Right, so that's about place. Talk about improving flexibility within the program. So that doesn't necessarily mean shifting to a different location or students that are off campus. It might, but equally students on campus can develop by, uh, can, can benefit by developing programs to be more flexible in their approach and improving flexibility in the types of interactions within the course itself. So you'll notice that flexible learning is not just about distance education. It's not just about flexible delivery, which is really about the medium for engaging learners in flexible learning. It's about flexibility in its holistic understanding. Flexible to the individual learner's needs, flexible to the location and the timing, but also the way in which you develop the learning activities within the course. So what is 
absolutely central to flexible learning is learner-centred control or learner-centred instruction. The emphasis is on learner choice and learner decision making and so learners themselves have some choice about how they engage in the learning experience. Now that might be as simple as providing a learning environment that gives multimodal options for students so students who are more visual have access to visual learning materials. Students who need more oral material have podcasts and so forth. Um, some students need a combination of those. Some students prefer text-based. Obviously students who have disabilities are going to need alternative formats. That may be, mean braille output. It may mean digital material that is being designed to be able to be accessed by assistive technologies such as braille readers and so forth, screen readers. So when we start to talk about technology, one of the things that we now have access to is much more advanced technologies that incorporate some of these flexible modalities. For example, the iPad or the tablet computer, iPad's perhaps not as popular um, in South Africa because of the expense, but of course we've got tablet computers running um, Android operating system which are much more cost effective. And most of those tablet devices have incorporated principles that we refer to as universal design. And by universal design, I mean they've been designed in such a way that they accommodate diverse user needs, including people with disabilities. So for example, iPhone, iPad will have spoken output. Um, it also, as you would know, gives you the option very simply to zoom out the text, uh, the size of the text and so forth. Um, you know, there are a lot of people with disabilities, even blind people, who are very effectively able to use iPads and iPhone devices. So what we're now talking about when we talk about some of these newer technologies is mobile devices that allow the students to learn any place, any time, and at a relatively low cost. Second, universal design principles, which means even students with certain kinds of disabilities can use these devices quite effectively. So we're into an exciting period where we're driven by the pedagogy and assisted by the technology to make the learning more flexible in every sense of the, the word. Um, one of the things is the the focus on the teacher now as a facilitator and obviously as we start to talk about web 2.0 technologies we can see why that's really important about the collaborative nature of that. Um, and uh, one of the principles again going back many years back by Collis and Moonen was the principle of negotiation. Um, uh, now um, David um, bowed has done a lot of work on alternative assessment. Is any of you familiar with David Bout's work? Okay, now you would know from his work that negotiation is fairly central to that. And again, so we're starting to see that even though we're looking back at some fairly um, old uh, uh, references with Collis and Moonen back to 1997, we are seeing some of the beginnings of that notion of alternative ways in which students can engage in a more flexible uh, learning approach. This model by um, uh, Collis and Noonan, unfortunately it's fairly um, small, but I can give you the reference to it. Going back to these various dimensions of flexible learning, notice they talk about flexibility relating to time. And if you can see, they've provided a continuum so at the one extreme is fixed time and at the other extreme is flexible. So they talk about the various ways in which time can be flexible. <coughs> time for starting and finishing a course, time for submitting assignments and interacting with the course, uh, the tempo pace of the studying, you know, allowing some flexibility in the pace in which material is delivered. Um, and when moments of assessment occur and so things like alternative assessments really important there where we talk about formative uh, assessment as a continual assessment process. Then they talk about flexibility relating to content again on that continuum from 
continuum from fixed to flexible. So some of the things they talk about are, you know, the topics of the course could be flexible and be open to negotiation. The sequence of different parts of a course, the orientation, how much is theory, how much is pra practice, practice based, how the combination works what kinds of materials are used, and assessment approaches. And they talk about entry requirements is another uh, way in which flexibility can be incorporated, conditions for participation and so forth. Instructional approach and resources, what sorts <coughs> of technologies, what sorts of modalities are going to be used. And the delivery and logistics, the time and the place, the methods of technology, the helps and support systems that are put in place, and the delivery channels. All of these are various dimensions uh, that we talk about when we talk about flexible learning. And as you can see, it's, it's not an either one or the other, but rather this notion of a continuum. What's my mouse here? Oh, there we go. I want to um, just talk through a particular case study that um, I've been involved with with, with this, a first year uh, students, uh, a, a, a course focusing on first year students. Um, the course introduces students to digital media. It's a challenging course and the reason that it's challenging is that we have students from a range of disciplinary areas, computer science, arts, journalism, education, psychology, social work, trying to engage uh, students across that spectrum of disciplinary areas has been incredibly challenging, particularly in something where we're trying to introduce them to the use of digital technologies. So if you can kind of imagine the mix, you've got computer science students who are sitting up there bored silly because they know all of that stuff. And then you've got the art students sitting over there who are are saying, whoa, slow down, this is just too much, what, I don't get it. How do you get that kind of happy medium? That was one of the challenges we were, we were experiencing. The second was that we were noticing, you know, less and less attendance at lectures. So clearly the didactic, you know, lecture-based approach just was not hitting the mark. So we were thinking about more flexible ways in which we could engage this diversity of learners but still provide the kind of structured curriculum. And, so, and this case study really goes over the last six years. It's kind of been an action research uh, of a course in development. So first of all, going back to the literature, what might be the reasons that our, the students just not turning up to lectures? So some of the things that we, we looked at was reports by Ku et al, McInnes, Tinto and so forth and you know they've talked about the it's that complexity of student characteristics, external <coughs> pressures, the things I talked about more and more students working and so forth. The, the reflection and the complexity of the student lives which impacts on the expectations and so forth. So looking at strategies that have uh, been reported in the literature to try to engage with this level of student diversity, needing to build on student strengths and engaging those first year learners, because I'm sure it's the same for your university, attrition is, at, is highest in that first year. You've only got really that small window to engage with the learners. And so those, all those issues of retention really in, gave us an imperative, if you like, to really focus on ways to engage this particular cohort. And again, I've talked about the top-down, bottom-up approach, but that's really what we've had to do with, within our institution to engage you know, these learners who are less on campus and less involved. So looking at the work of Bovell, Morse and Bully, they talk about making effective use of collaborative and interactive activities. Great, we've got Web 2.0 technologies to support and help that. Providing a challenging and interconnected curriculum, but that's still pretty difficult when you've got such a diverse group of students. Emphasising self-development, self-directed inquiry, and the use of formative feedback and assessment, looking at some of the work of David Bowd, etc. All right, so how were we going to engage with this flexible learning approach to 
I kind of reach out to this diverse student audience. Okay, so one of the things that we thought about doing was introducing more of a problem-based learning environment and also enhancing the teaching and research nexus. If we could find ways, even in first year, to introduce students using these digital technologies but in a way that was more challenging to them, then we were more likely to cater to that diverse group of students. And of course the effective use of ICTs is integral to that, into the, to that process. So Kerry Lee Krauss um, was involved in a very large study along with several others at the University of Melbourne where they looked at the ways in which students were using Web 2.0 technologies and they looked at the new generation of young people coming into the university. <laughs> You'll notice there's lots of pet names for this generation, you know, Generation Y or Gen Y, Net Gen, Millennials, Digital Natives, um, you name it, there's been a label for, for this population of students. Now, I don't really subscribe to those labels, nor do I subscribe to the suggestion in any way that they're a homogeneous group. Our research, we mirrored their research, in fact, at the University of South Australia, and our findings were very similar. Far from being a homogeneous group of young, digitally connected uh, students, we found there was enormous diversity even within that age cohort. We had students that were very much connected and <coughs> using all of the technologies. We had a larger percentage that maybe used Facebook and that was um, an instant messaging and that was about it. You know, So there was a broad spectrum but also a more nuanced understanding showed us that there was differences for example, between students who are international students who are tending to use the technology more effectively than our local students, which was an interesting finding. We also found that students with disabilities were using these technologies a lot less, despite the fact that they actually provided, potentially, greater opportunity for engaging them. What was interesting to us was we also found that students who were uh, studying full-time and working part-time were using the technology a whole lot less. They just didn't have time in their lives for the technology. <laughs> so it certainly was a wake up call to us when we did our research and we had 812 participants in our study, so it was a region reasonably large study, um, that we cannot make these kinds of assumptions. And that again gets back to the importance of flexible learning. Flexible learning in our understanding of how the technologies are used. What's guided our whole institutional approach and certainly provided the framework, I guess, for redesigning this first year course is the university's teaching and learning strategy. Um, and in fact, uh, in um, 2007, and it's, it culminated in 2010, the university made a lot of it in funding available to support its student uh, engagement program. And there were three dimensions to that. One was they recognised the importance of engaging first year learners with active student programs that integrate academic, institutional and social aspects of university life, trying to build that community. Now how do you build a community if the students are not on campus much? Well, that's again why we've had to use those technologies in more effective ways to bring, to build that social network of students together. Providing opportunities for students to engage in experiential learning um, and also to make sure that our teaching strategies are informed by the literature, by the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, so experiential learning probably needs a little bit more elaboration. It's, um, our university has a particular uh, approach to its understanding of experiential <coughs> learning. It incorporates for our university practice-based learning, which means you know hands-on, whether it's in a clinical laboratory, whether it's role-play simulations on a computer, whether it's simulated activities, um, chemistry experiments on a computer, um, but also service learning, where our students are actually out in the community doing work with community. Um, our, again, while I said I don't subscribe to you know the labels of Gen Y. 
I think there are certain characteristics that um, are written in the literature which I've sort of recognised in each successive generation of students. And um, one of the things that the literature talks about is, you know, that the students want to um, be connected, they want to be networked in some way, so there, there is that sense of needing the social community support. Um, but one of the other things that the literature talks about is that they care about things that matter. Have you noticed that in your students? I certainly have. Um, if I think back five years ago, you know, they did assignments and they did the work because, you know, well, you had to do that to pass. But I found in successive intakes of students that there's a, and the younger students are coming in with this sort of sense of purpose and commitment. Now, that may be that they're just more aware of the world around them through the whole range of technologies and the internet and social networking, Twitter and so on. It's you know, pretty much in the face all the time now. Um, but what I've found is that it's carried over to their expectations in the learning and in the assessment where my students uh, don't want to be bothered with assignments that aren't going to actually make a difference, you know. Why would I do this? It's not going to actually change anything. So they, they really have this sense of purpose. And so um, when I first started with making changes to this course, I thought, well, well, we'll get them to undertake research about a social issue. They care about social issues, so they learn a little bit about inquiry-based learning how to do a literature uh, search, how to do a, a literature review, making informed decisions about the choice of, you know, uh, or, uh, authoritative sources of in information and so forth. But also, how to use Web 2.0 technology. So, you know, years ago, academics used to always say to their students, and I do not want to see any references that include Wikipedia. Were you in that camp? We were told we had to be in that camp. Well, now we actually say we want, to use, want you to use Wikipedia and we want you to, to make judgments about whether it's a reliable source or not. Even better, one step better, they could actually edit in Wikipedia and correct inaccuracies, all right? So it's, it's really shifted our way, hasn't it, of approaching the use of these because we recognise, don't we, that students have access to all this information. What's more important is those lifelong learning skills, to be critical thinkers, to be able to make informed judgments and to know what's trustworthy sources of information. So we, uh, at the same time as I was making these changes, were introducing the Moodle open source learning management system, which of course incorporates all these Web 2.0 technologies. So it was a great opportunity for us to transform this course by making much more effective use of um, some of those technologies. So students, um, so the original um, course structure was three separate assignments. The first assignment was that they did a, um, an analysis of a particular piece of media of their choice um, and they had to support that you know, with references and so forth. The second assignment was they were learning basically how to do filming you know, uh, and the third assignment was how to create a website. Not terribly challenging course if you already know about these technologies because that's the other thing a lot of students are coming in to courses and they've already got this stuff at home you know so what we tried to value add was the research based component but we wanted to do it in, in such a way that the media they were still learning the critical skills in using digital media so what we did was we set up a blog for the students within the learning management system which became their reflective journal the reflective journal was the place where they documented their research based on their particular social issue. So they did idea generation, they were forced to um, articulate their value positions on the social issue that they were researching and then challenge their assumptions, reverse their value position to um, look at the in interesting juxtapositions and to have a different and more broad uh, perspective on that. And uh, so Formative assessments are a critical part of this course as well, so that they are getting feedback through their blog progressively, but they're also engaging in peer review in a progressive way. So again, that two-way interaction, working with each other as well as interacting with me. Well, our first revisions didn't work <laughs> terribly well. And the reason being we moved too far away from practical activities and too heavily to theory 
and research. So we went back to the drawing board and, and made further revisions um, to get a better balance to that. And uh, so, again, drawing on some of the literature, we looked at more effective use of this practice-led research approach and looking at how we could better su support the student diversity. Um, so we focused much more on media practice informed by and through their research. Um, reflective practice was really fundamental to the way in which they were using the blog and we tried to engage them in creative problem solving so that they saw that research was actually a creative approach. It wasn't something that you just do in a laboratory, but it was a creative approach in itself. And also, we focused on their final artifact, which was a digital story about the social issue, as being um, a research artifact in its own right. Um, so we uh, started to develop a framework to support creative problem solving. They, uh, we made much more effective use of the blogs and we incorporated a range of creative brainstorming activities, recording their research findings and so forth. They did pre-production work via their blog and what we then introduced was the service learning component, which was a little ambitious when you consider that these are first years, first semester, first year students. But we, this first, um, well, the second revision, we gave them the opportunity. We didn't um, make it compulsory, but we gave them the opportunity to work with a community group if, around their social issue if they wanted to. So it was optional. So again, really trying to build on the fact that they seem to be interested in things that matter. So we used the Moodle environment, pro profile pages, visual diary, blog, wikis. Uh, discussion forums, live chat, messaging, YouTube. So we had all of those aspects um, of which students used various components. They weren't required to use all of them. Um, and working on the real projects. We also got industry. We got visiting speakers for industry. Um, and we introduced things like the Viewer's Choice Award and Industry Awards so that their final session, they, were very, they could showcase their final digital <coughs> artefacts to industry who critiqued the work publicly and then you know, they could defend their work in a public forum. But also for students who couldn't come to that event, we had the Viewer's Choice Award where they could vote with their telephone uh, on which, which of the uh, productions they felt uh, earned that. Now, I am hoping that I can connect to our Moodle site to actually show you some of the work with the organisation. But having got in so involved in researching around, uh, this particular production was around cataract blindness in Bali, she got so immersed in it that she then went to the John Fawcett Foundation, which raises funds for cataract surgery. And they were so thrilled with her final digital artefact that they made copies, 200 copies of it, and distributed it to all their supporters for, for the following Christmas. So that's really a great turnaround for you know, students in first year to be so engaged in their, in their learning that not only do they attend class in the flexible sense of the word, this student was, was studying externally. She never came onto campus, but she was religiously in the in the real-time chat session that I offered each week, talking about her ideas as she generated her creative concept at the same time as investigating you know, the social <coughs> issue itself. Um, and then for her to also then occupy her own holiday time and take the opportunity to take the shots. And we've seen that repeated. This wasn't a one-off. In, in the last offering which is just finished, the semester just gone. I had other students who were doing exactly the same thing. They had the break in the middle of the semester and they were going on various holidays and they were taking their cameras with them to do their research while they were on holiday. So if you can get that kind of engagement, you know that the flexible learning approach is having some kind of impact. Um, students learn about you know, web design and inclusive design so that their websites are accessible to, to people with disabilities. So it's also about ensuring that students understand about social and ethical responsibility as graduates. Um, but what was interesting to us also was the number of students who chose to publish their website onto the World Wide Web 
and in some cases even set up their own cause on the web. So again, a lovely outcome from you know a, a first year course. Um, I talked about the Viewers' Choice Award. We, uh, we use mobile phone at, uh, app called Votopedia. It's a free service. I, it's available to us. I'm not sure if it's available worldwide. But similar applications are available now where students view the digital story and then they basically dial a number de depending on which number they want to vote for. So again, that's a way of engaging with your students off campus with the students on campus, because this was at a final event, so students off campus are still able to contribute. We didn't use Twitter, but you could imagine you could just as easily engage your students off campus via Twitter in real time for different events that you're running. So again, it's all about trying to engage all of the learners together. Those of you that come to my sessions on Second Life or who have been to my previous sessions will know that we also provide the opportunity to, for students to come to a shared virtual space via their avatar. And again, they interact with students on campus in that shared virtual space. So uh, reflecting back on the early literature where we talked about that sense of uh, disconnect with the campus because they're not on campus, all these technologies are ways of reaching out to students who physically can't come on campus but who become part of that one shared community and that's really important. So technology isn't driving it. That's, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. The pedagogy is driving it. The way in which you use the pedagogy to enhance your interaction and facilitate that learner-centred approach to, to learner engagement is what's critical. When we talk about the technology, all that's doing is supporting it. What's nice about the emergence of some of the newer technologies over the last few years has been that they support that much more effectively than in the past. I talked about the formative peer review process. This is about alternative assessment, you know, the sorts of things David Bout has talked about, negotiated assessment. In this case, peer review is where the students post up their work onto the Moodle site and it's voluntary, it, there's no compulsory aspect to this. They're not graded on it, which again is about getting buy-in for learning because it benefits the learner who posts their work up and it benefits the person that's critiquing the work because they're learning valuable skills. A lot of the students talk about the fact that it really helped them to see other students' work. And it's interesting how far we've come because, you know, we used to, be, students used to be really protective about their assignments. Oh, can't possibly show that assignment, they might cheat. Well, one of the interesting things about our move to this more open environment is I see far less plagiarism now because it's so open. It's a little bit like Wikipedia being self-correcting. You know, people might make a change up there and it might be to defame a company or, you know, put inaccurate information about a company, but very quickly it gets corrected, doesn't it? it it's about that notion of the, the collaboration <laughs> of many people, the crowd, so, um, that, that makes it much more transparent. And that transparency, I think, is what's really important there. So students do share their work, they learn from critiquing each other's work, but they also get valuable feedback that they incorporate themselves. I've tried various combinations of tutors and myself being part of the community and not. Um, and what I find is the students still like us to be part of that community. Uh, part of it is around the authority bit, you know, that this is an authoritative voice. But part of it, I think, is because it's more about a mentor relationship then um, you know we're kind of outside that circle. It's about us being part of that community as well. Um, now, I've chosen a formative peer review approach because it is about students both assessing, self-assessing their own work and assessing other students' work, but without actual marks associated. Um, we've done a lot of research into, and I've worked with colleagues who've tried the peer assessment without the peer review process, and it's been far less um, successful. Part of it is around the insecurity of students assessing each other's work. 
part of it's about this thing that, well, you're paid to be the teacher, so, you know, you should be assessing her work. Um, but part of it's they're not prepared. So one of the nice things about formative peer review is that it is a, a gentle way of preparing students for alternative forms of assessment. In fact, if you introduce this first and then you have a peer assessment process, we've found that works much better because this is part of the process of developing the skills required. Um, so we've tended to go for the last option, which is the two-stage assignments. Feedback on the first stage, allowing students to make changes to their work, uh, to improve on the work, and then giving the opportunity for final assessment. I sort of base that you know, on our own experience. If you only get feedback after it's too late, you're not really encouraged to ever make the change. What this does is I give them a one week window to make the changes and it's like the hive of activity. So instead of feedback just being a summative process right at the end where okay I got the feedback but I've never had to act on it and they're probably going to forget it for future. This way the adrenaline's going, I've got one week to really improve my grade. And I'm finding about 70% of the students are, remember this is voluntary, are participating. So it's not bad. And the condition under which they participate is that if they wish to have feedback, they have to review other students' work because it's a two-way relationship. The other th interesting thing I've found about you know, the, the changes as students become sort of more um, use, you know, more commonly using social media is there is that greater sense of responsibility now, you know, because they're so used to social media where their colleagues and their peers and they interact and they share and do things. So I am finding that there's much more engagement by students, not only to review the one compulsory peer review they have to do to, to, to get feedback, a lot of them are actually taking it upon themselves to review maybe half a dozen student sites and fairly comprehensive feedback, not just, you know, looks great, you know, um, but usually fairly um, reflective about the sorts of things that could improve on the student's work. I've talked about the research-based approach and so the formative peer review really is that uh, cycle where students review their work, post it up, they get feedback, they make the change, and then they can revise and then submit. And I, I become part of that process. I usually wait right until the end so that they've all engaged in the peer review. And they might, might come, I will come in with some reflection on the peers' feedback. So it's also about affirming the valuable <coughs> contribution the peers have made to the critique, as well as offering a few additional suggestions to that. Um, so the student comments about that process is they talked about the benefit of being able to review their peers' assignments to reflect on their own work. They get a benchmark. They sort of know what's expected. The value that in comparing their work against other assignments and uh, being able to improve on that and the communication process uh, which has facilitated collaboration. I actually did a fairly in-depth study looking at whether how many students did in fact improve on their work and whether it improved their grade. And it was over, overwhelmingly positive that those students who took on the feedback, elected to make changes, did improve their grade. Usually at least a whole grade level. So if it was a credit level, they would ri rise to at least a distinction level. The other interesting thing I found when we looked at the data analysis was students who were insecure and underrated their performance because they were asked to rate their own performance as well as their critique their peers and take on board their peers feedback. Those who underrated their performance first time round were much more accurate after they had the, the feedback and then acted on that feedback. So in the second assessment that they did of their performance they were pretty much on the mark and there was a very high correlation between the student's self-assessment and my assessment at the end. So the formative approach is very, very powerful in that way. And of course, the whole Web2 learning management system environment supports that kind of framework very well. Um, this is hard to read, but the blue um, is 
early offerings and the um, mauve, oh, pinky, reddy colour is the most uh, our recent offering. That was about a 2009 offering. And you'll see the increase on all of the course. This is a course evaluation instrument. It's a mandated evaluation we do at the end of each offering of a course. So on every one of the items, you can see the increase on their rating of that course after we've made those changes. Um, I'll be doing another similar comparison uh, at the end of this year just to see what's whether that's held over a longer period of time. We also asked them whether um, they thought research was important in this course and the first item was developed a better understanding of research and design, second enjoyed the challenge of undertaking my own project, you know it's about choice, okay, so feeling that they've got some choice in the nature of the topic that they've chosen and that research was good to include and again you're seeing on the, the, the far right of each of those is the most uh, well, the most recent at the time we did that study uh, rating and again it, on all of those measures it had increased quite considerably so it did have a positive effect. Here are some of the qualitative comments. I thoroughly enjoyed the topic. It was creative, high degree of creative freedom, choice again, despite the limitations set down. Creativity <coughs> challenged my technical ability, uh, more creative ideas forced me to learn new uh, digital media technologies and techniques. Um, one of the interesting things was the blog, which was the reflective journal. It's been one of the assignments I've enjoyed doing the most. Um, it was tiring, but it did guide a well-researched digital story, so it was effective. Um, and the, the second point, the blog was the basis for reflection and was very important for my research. Without the blog, I wouldn't have taken the direction I did. Um, uh, I'm just going to see if I can... Um, flick over to our learning management system to show you the actual course because we've got it, they're just finishing peer review right now, so oh, updates. It would be rather nice if you can, and I know we're just about on time, but if it can just show you a little bit of the course. Oh. And I'm just going to... Have we got internet in here? Yes. Oh. Voluntary being marked. I didn't quite understand that. Okay. The participation in the peer review is entirely voluntary. They're not marked on that at all. Yeah. Um, why is it? Oh, we're on your... <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the purpose then if they're not marked? You're just giving them... It's a, it's a chance to develop their own ability to assess their own work and to critique the work of others which are of important lifelong learning skills in their own right. But it's also an opportunity for them to improve on their work prior to final assessment which we find actually does have, a, a, obviously, has an in incredibly important impact on their final outcome for the course. Yeah. So that would be your key focus? Yes. Explain to them the beginning, and they're quite okay with that because a lot of our students, you know, they feel like what we're doing um, things. Yeah, it used I. To be important, you know, well, the scene is more important. Still not. Still not. Um, yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing. We. Uh, they are benefiting from it in all of the ways that I mentioned. So you know, it's not all one way they are going to get reasonable benchmark on the quality of other students work um, they're also getting valuable feedback and they're getting a window so you know that one week they get an extra week to improve on their work if they don't participate they don't get that extra week either so you know so there, there's got to be some little carrots in there but you know i guess what we're trying to do is move away from the fixation on i'm only doing this because it's being assessed to getting them to see that learning is beneficial in its own right. Mm. Goodness me. No, it's not working. <coughs> uh, what yes, about sir. if I just, just try and connect, wait on, go back to my laptop. Mm -hmm. And I'll try and connect with Vodafone. Uh, let me just try and connect that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. There it is. Just give me an idea. 
Yes, your floor sizes? Um, this is a first year core course, so we have uh, about 350 and it's run um, twice a year on campus as well as externally, as well as in Malaysia. So it is a fairly substantial course, yeah. Um, in an earlier meeting, I was talking about the fact that with Moodle, we've um, got learning analytics, which is, allows us to be able to harvest data in a meaningful way so that we can make decisions about or we can improve our ability to monitor student performance. So that was in fact an, an example of the course I was talking about at the meeting where I can look and see how many students are logging into the Moodle environment, how many are engaging in the blog and while I can't sort of obviously I can't make quality decisions about what they're posting it gives me at least a flag so I know which students are falling behind and then with 350 students there's no way I'm going to be able to log in and look at every single blog every week which is what I would ideally love to do but this way I'm at least able to flag the students who I know clearly are falling behind and you know when we talk about flexible learning really it gets back to the earlier point I made in the presentation about it being personalized and the personalised thing is about all those other social circumstances that I mentioned at the start of the presentation that impact on their learning engagement. And one, even if we can use some of these tools to at least identify, well, for some reason, the student's falling out of the loop, you know, you can get them early. But if you get to week six and first assignment's not handed in, they've probably fallen so far behind it's too late to pick them up. And that's one of the challenges with students who are off campus is of course you don't physically see them to know whether they're engaging. So having a combination of a learning management system and the use of those learning analytics allows us to focus our attention on where clearly students are going to, are at risk and are falling by the wayside. Yeah. Oh, let me just see if this is going to work now. Uh, otherwise we just have to um, call it quits because I know we're out of time. We yeah. Um. Yeah. Um, this wonderful seminar you've given us, which is also quite timely because um, our Minister of Education has now opened distance and flexible learning to other institutions, yes. not only UNISA, so there's a new document. And, you know, the time is quite right for mm -hmm. um, higher education institutions to relook what they're doing. Yeah. So I hope it's provided some um, food for thought. And I think the example that you gave us is very inspiring. And I'm sure you've written about it. I have, yes. So quite if a few people papers. would like mm. to um, to get access to these papers, and I'm hoping that you're going to make your presentation available for those who so would like. Can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with all Thanks the references. Very much, okay. Thank, Thank you. you.